Welcome to Pet Sitter Confessional. Today, we are brought to you by Time to Pet and Pet Perennials. What does it mean to provide a personalized and positive pet care experience every time we're over? And what can we do as a business owner, as a pet sitter dog walker, to cultivate breakthrough moments with our clients and their pets? Today, we are super excited to have Alicia Riley, owner of Alicia's Pet Playcations, on the show to talk about how pet care is not a one-size-fits-all solution and how that's a really positive thing, how she's growing through networking, talking to people, understanding how animals are the universal connector, and why she started a coffee shop, too. Let's get started. Thank you so much for having me. So as you said, I am Alicia. I am co-owner with my husband, Zach Riley, an operator of Pet Placations. We are a small pet care business based in Peyton, Colorado, just east of Colorado Springs. And we specialize in daily dog walks, drop-in visits for pets of all species, and sleepover stays in client homes. So we've been in business for just over eight years now. And have found great success in what we do. I play with animals for a living and love just about every moment of it. <laughs> just just, just about. Maybe we'll get to some of those just about moments uh, later. But as far as um, your your business, you said you've been in business for eight years. What, what, what changed eight years ago? Well, I, first of all, didn't have any pets in my personal home until I was about 15 or 16. So I always say that Everything I've done since that moment is severely overcompensating for my lack of animals in my childhood. <laughs> I figured go at 110 plus percent or not at all. So I filled my entire life with animals. But about eight years ago, I had left one of the most magical places in the world after working there for two years. Um thought I was going to work there for the rest of my life. It ended up not being the fit that I had envisioned and found myself lost at the age of 20, not knowing where I was going in a career or in schooling or really anything. So I started pet sitting on the side, as I know many of us did before they fell into this, um, helping out friends and family and neighbors and said, this is what I'll do in between things until I find that normal job, that career that I meant to do. It Little did I know that six months later, I would decide that this was my real career. And in the last eight years, we have made it through cross-country moves from Florida to Colorado. We've packed up and restarted a couple times within Colorado and settled here where we are now and have been for the last two years and expanded to the point where I have seven staff members and we service just over 300 homes in the area. Mentioned that you were feeling lost at... 20. Um, describe that feeling, because I, I know that that's something that I think we all encounter at some points. So when you, when you talk about being lost, where where was that coming from? And why did you feel so lost at that time? I think we do definitely all have that moment at some point, but we're all really afraid to say anything about it, let anyone know about it. But I had these clear visions of what I was supposed to do in my life, why I was going to school. I was a degree in finance. I wanted to work for one of those big companies in the Orlando, Florida area, in the behind the scenes, back end of things, told them that, and basically faced the realization that I was but a number amongst many others, just a cog in the machine. And as a young professional trying to make their way, that doesn't sit too well. And it's kind of that like bulldozer moment where you're like, oh no, someone told me I don't matter. I know I do, but that must mean it's not here. Where do I go from here? You can find yourself realizing, oh, I, I am just a person, right? I am just a thing a thing really to this to this company to the to making this work and while it is important to recognize that you know we are all re replaceable i think it's important to note that that doesn't mean we don't have value right that's that's where we take that and we go oh they don't even see me as valuable because they see me as replaceable so i'm not valuable to them so i have to go find value elsewhere and so you said you mentioned you started doing this pet sitting thing what about it stuck to you you said after about six months you realized that this was something a little bit more than just an interim position yeah it was a really weird transition time you know having all of those plans just fall apart basically in one statement from a manager 
So it was just my happy place. It was my escape from trying to figure out how to get through all of the job hunting and what to do with the rest of my college degree that I couldn't decide, should I even follow through with it after I was potentially not going to use it? So animals were my escape. They were my happy place. We had rescue animals of our own that we could never leave at boarding facilities or at vets when we traveled because our one dog is the best dog in the world. And I always preface with that, that I make fun of him because I love him, (laughs) but he is an 18 pound chewini that chewed a hole through a crate, the hole of the size of my head. And when he couldn't escape, he just peed out of it. So I can't leave him places. I can't, I can't do that to anyone else. (laughs) If I went and left him at the vet, I know I'd be coming back to a sick dog or a damages bill from the vet themselves of like you, your dog has caused property damage. I can't do this. So, (laughs) and a a cease and desist letter, right? (laughs) Right. Like take this, do not bring it back. And (laughs) we've had him for eight years and he has not changed one bit, but that was what we were told was the equivalent of crate train. So he was our like personal moment of needing to figure out alternatives kind of brought us into this path of alternative pet care of someone staying in our home, living with them or visiting them several times. I turned to do it part-time and it turned out I was really good at it because I have this high anxiety dog that I, I get it. I relate to it. And I could see that in other people's pets, that they were in their happy place and their homes. And that if I could provide any peace of mind, I was in my happy place too. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting how those experiences kind of shape. They're very eye opening, right? When you go to try something for the first time, especially if you're like, oh, well, this is what everybody else does. or this is what mm-hmm. it's, it is expected or I expect to be able to do. And then when it doesn't work, it really puts you on that back foot to realize uh, that you feel that that your own anxiousness, your own anxiety start kicking up and realize, oh, this is where a lot of people come from whenever I, they get on the phone with me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I still, at this point now, I'm fortunate enough to have the staff that I can rely on. But before that, the only people that were allowed to watch my animals were families. So when we moved from Florida to Colorado, we lost that option all over again. And even though I had been in this business as just a duo with my husband and myself, all of that anxiety flooded back when we moved out here of who watches my animals? How do I do this all over again? I don't have anyone I can trust. Yeah, uh, we uh, we have a 15 year old dachshund named Kobe. We've had him for almost 12 years now, and yeah, in the time that in that amount of time, we've needed the kind of services that we offer, I think three times. Uh, and so it's very interesting to <laughs> to say like we offer this service, and it's one that we've even rarely used ourselves because of the anxieties that we have around our dogs. And and right now, kind of we're in the same position as you are now, Alicia, of having staff who can step in that we have personally trained, have a, have our oversight, have all of those things. I mean, like, okay, <laughs> this is now a person who we can trust to step in and, and care for our own animals. Yeah, it's it's a weird thing to see it from both sides, but I'm I'm glad to know that the service that we provide is so valued. And I've felt that on my end as well as the consumer too. Yeah. You you mentioned in your story there that you have packed up and moved and restarted several times. So you've restarted your pet care business a couple times. Is that right? Yeah, we actually started things down in Florida. Uh, We were more of that makeshift doggy daycare out of your own home, falling into some gray area about whether or not you should even be doing it. Um, And then after that, you know, six months of doing this on the side. And as a hobby, we went through all of the steps of, oh, this is a real business. Now we need to get insurance and all of those fun business things, tax professionals, accountants, bookkeepers. Um, And as we were establishing all of that in Florida, we just had a moment where we knew that Florida was not where we wanted to spend the rest of our lives and packed up and moved to Colorado sight unseen. Neither my husband nor myself had ever stepped foot in the state. And that also meant packing up the business and trying to figure out how to start over with an entirely new service area and clientele. Did you do anything with the business preemptively before you got on the ground in Colorado? Or did you basically just unpack it and try and start doing something once you were there? 
No, it would have been really smart to do some market research or some planning, but we were so enveloped and still, you know, pretty young. So when you move, you're more focused on getting all of the animals to the right places and the boxes to the right places. And how do I afford the, you know, pod trucks to get everything out that the business was not. I truly didn't know if the business was going to make the transition over But as soon as we got to Colorado, when we realized what a pet loving place it was, we decided to just kind of start word of mouth advertising, get to know the vets and the pet care supplies stores and stuff in the area and grew from there. That's It's interesting how effectively within the span of a year, you had started two different companies, right? We had just started in Florida and then you moved and you just started a brand new one there in Colorado. What kind of lessons did you bring into that second time around um, after kind of doing some of those initial things in Florida? We had learned a lot and were able to start things up pretty much exponentially out in Colorado. And I'm very thankful for that. We knew that we needed to have contracts in place, all of the safeties and securities as we were getting all of our new clients for the first time in Colorado. So we didn't have to cross any of those bridges having already had the clients in place and then trying to transition them over to different protocols. So Mm. everything was much more seamless as a business and seemed a lot more professional from the get-go once we hit Colorado. Yeah. Kind of had that nice clean start um, to to really be, be brand new in that area. Um, And so you said you started uh, marketing with going to visit places. What are, what are some, I'm asking these questions because I see this, these asked all the time about people who are moving, have a new job opportunity or looking to be moving closer to family, but they've got this business and they're terrified about moving it and don't know how they're going to make it to a new location. Yeah, it's really scary, but there's a lot of ways to make it work. And it's definitely worth it. I am a big believer in word of mouth networking. I am not tech savvy enough to social media worth anything, despite the fact that I'm not even 30. I never made it to the TikTok trend. (laughs) I'm way behind on that stuff. But I know how to network in person. And there are so many amazing pet professionals in whatever area someone moves to that knows the area, that knows what kind of pets you're going to encounter, that can give you the little tips and tricks of how to become invaluable to the community, that those are the people you want to talk to and to become friends with because really they're a valuable resource. So we went and just started by finding the things that we wanted on the personal level for our animals. We were looking for a new vet because we had just moved. So let's talk to all of the vets in the area, find one that fits our needs. And in the meantime, mention what we do professionally along the way. We were looking for a groomer and a bather. So let's do the same thing all around, leave some cards along the way that we have and just kind of get that earworm that we exist and we're happy to help propel anyone else's business in return for just knowing that we exist of kind of a back and forth is really what the animal community is about all around. Yeah. And that's a great place to start from. Cause I, I know uh, I, even I will sit outside of a business and I'm going doing door knocking and introducing myself. And I'll always, I have that question of like, how do I, how do I talk to them about what do I do? What's my, what's my opening here? How do I introduce myself? Where do I start? And to go to places that are a resource for you personally are is fantastic, right? And I know not everybody who's in this business has a pet or is, is is able to have a pet, but think of it from the perspective of your clients. Where where would they want to be connected with? What information would they need to have? Who would they need to talk to? And approach it from that perspective of going, hey, I'm here to just get connected with the resources for pets in our community, not just help me, but also to help my clients. I want to introduce myself and say hi. It, it it's much more natural of a conversation at that point. It really makes a big difference. And like we have a connection out here where we are now that makes treats and we've had one that makes uh, locally sourced dog food where they were making most of it in their home, but they were actually certified. And even if you don't have pets, those are great things of like, I have a client that's looking for a new alternative to dry kibble or is looking for a birthday cake for their dog. And I'm trying to do that research for them to make their life easier. So animals are the universal connector for pretty much all of us, whether you have one personally or not, they in are 
in all aspects of our lives. So they're always a good talking point that will bring people together. <laughs> they, they really are. Most, I mean, uh, it's no, it's amazing when we go and talk to people, um, you know, they'll start pulling out their phone and they'll say, is it okay if I show you a picture of my dog? And I'm like, I'd be angry if you didn't show me a picture of your dog. Like, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a coffee shop for a meeting completely unrelated to our pet care business. I briefly mentioned what I do for a living and the barista at the end of the counter as she handed off my drink was like, wait, you need to see this and pulled out a picture of her cat pupils dialing in full catnip mode she's like i thought you would want this in your day and it's like of course i do you know me so well (laughs) it is it's a great reminder that we have such a wonderful connection point to our community to the people around us that if you focus it back on that as resources as helping people you're going to find that there are a lot more connections out there than you ever anticipated it's not just the pet food store. It's not just the, um, you know, the, 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 the groomer or the vet or the trainer or these pet centric places. It's also places where the owners or the employees are pet fanatics and finding them is kind of that extra step that you can really start building out that network. Yeah, definitely. Have you heard of Time to Pet? Dan from NYC Pooch has this to say. Time to Pet has been a total game changer for us. It's helped us streamline many aspects of our operation, from scheduling and communication to billing and customer management. Uh, We actually tested other pet sitting softwares in the past, but these other solutions were clunky and riddled with problems. Everything in Time to Pet has been so well thought out. It's intuitive, feature rich, and it's always improving. If you're looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show can save 50% off your first three months by visiting Time to Pet com slash confession. I, I know one of your goals, uh, Alicia, was to start your business to provide a personalized and positive pet care experience. And, and I was curious, kind of what, what does that look like in, in your mind and how do you execute on that? Yeah, so those words are usually kind of catch-all words, but they really mean a lot to me of that personalization is what we're here for and that positive experience translating both to the pets that we work with and the humans like we really take care of looking at the human side of client interaction just as much as we do the animals in our care i'm always going to advocate for the animals but i'm also going to phrase things in ways for the humans so that they understand so that they're spoken to gently so that they can be away and not feel uncomfortable. So in the time that we've done this, we've learned that pet care is not a one size fits all solution. And we've tailored our services to really make that clear. Not every household is going to do well with three half hour visits in a day or just hanging out from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. with them. That might not be what the client is looking for, but that doesn't mean that we're not a good fit. So we do meet and greet before we sign a client into anything, before they're locked into anything to make sure that we're on the same page with things. They talk us through the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And then I give them my recommendations of what works best. Some households do just fine with those three visits a day. And then others that we're going to, we are stopping by five times a day, not necessarily because the pet needs it, but because the owner needs it. And that's okay too. Um, (laughs) We let our clients pick and choose how long visits are instead of just saying it's a half hour or not at all, or it's 12 hours at night or not at all. So I let them mix and match, which also lets clients feel like they have some control over the situation. We do everything from 20 minute pop-ins just to do a quick cage cleaning or set down extra food for the cat, even though we were there this morning, all the way through multi-hour visits. So we've started to see a lot of clients saying, oh, I want a half hour in the morning to do breakfast and then they'll be fine for a few hours, but then let's do an hour midday so they can really go run and play. And then a half hour again at dinner. Oh, but can you stop by for 20 more minutes right before bed just to let them out and tell them I love them? <laughs> and that's what we'll do. That's totally fine. Mm-hmm. Um, some some houses, we do what we call an almost overnight, which has become my favorite thing. It's like that bed and breakfast option that's becoming more popular, where we chill with them from like 6 to 8 p.m. in the evening. It's that dinner time through tuck-in service. We come back first thing in the morning for an hour, and then we pop back for a shorter, say, 20 or 30-minute visit midday. That ability to customize things has made a world of difference from the owner side of things and really leaves them feeling like they're 
special because they are. It doesn't matter if you have 10 clients or 300 clients, they're all special and they're all super valuable. So we're going to tailor things to what it is that makes them as happy as possible. I know there are two general schools of thought on this and how we structure our services. There's the one that is we may need to make these as cookie cutter as possible so I can replicate it as easily as possible so that scheduling Mm -hmm. as easy as possible and as predictable as possible. And and then there's the full customization um, and, and direct involvement of the client in discussing and scheduling services to make it meet their needs. What kind of challenges do you face running a business like that when it comes to things like staffing, scheduling, booking clients, and knowing exactly how much you can take on in any given day? It's definitely challenging because every time I think that I'm going to be able to put this on my back burner of, oh, it's self-sustaining. I can truly just be an owner. I find myself swooping back in to handle a last minute scheduling issue. But I wouldn't have it any other way because my biggest outlook on things is no two animals are exactly the same. They all have different personalities and different needs. So the cookie cutter solution is going to leave someone out along the way. And if that means that I need to be more actively involved in my business, that doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. I want, I I have control issues as is. So if it means I have to stay controlling of the business just a little bit and That's really what I'm here for as an owner. I'm here to put out those small fires. I'm here to put out the concerns from owners or the I'm running behind moments from staff. That's my job. I started this business. I'm here to support everyone that interacts with our business, whether they be a client or a staff member or a pet. So the customized route has definitely made the most sense for us. That phrase, when you said, I, I started this business, I'm here for support. That is a, a change in job duties, though, right? At least like you, 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 you started this business and now you are in this management, this support role to continue to make it work. Uh, how has that change been for you as, as the business has grown and evolved? I've definitely needed to learn how to be a better communicator along the way because that's really what my role is now. Before, I was a dog walker or a cat petter or a cage cleaner. And now while I still do those things, those are in an act of support. Like you said, those are me jumping in to make sure that my staff stays on time or that extra little thing gets done. So I've really had to learn about all different types of communication. And that's been my biggest hurdle is I'm so used to doing things one specific way from when I was out on the front lines doing things all myself or my husband helping jump in from time to time. But now that I have seven other people that are doing the job that I once did, it's me becoming the middleman almost of a staff asking a question about a household, but the client is unreachable. So it's my job to help things run as fluidly as possible. And that's a big change from just leashing up and walking a dog for an hour at a time. It, it, it is. And I know for many people, including myself, it can be frustrating sometimes to to go, oh, I didn't oh, I didn't want to be figuring out how to solve this, you know, broken lock this morning or what? Why is this an issue? This Why am I? But right, like, it's like, that's not why I start. I didn't start to help somebody figure out an alarm code at 6 a.m. on a Sunday. Like that's a, truthfully, I mean, hand on heart. I didn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you've been following me around these last few days talking okay. about lock issues and alarm codes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just in the air. I think it's just the season. But it, yeah. but yeah, it's going reflecting and going, okay, that's not why I started, but it's one of the reasons why I continue. It's because I am supporting people in our mission, in our values, in executing on this high level of care that that I know we can provide. And that's what I get to do these days. And that's what I get to do to serve my clients, my staff, and the pets. I really like the I get to do in, instead of the I have to is, is really how I try to approach each day. I'm not the best at it every single day, but it's where I try to return to if I get to do this. I never in my wildest dreams would have thought that I would start a business at 20, almost 21, and still be running it almost a decade later. Mm. I never thought at 20 that I would be paying the paychecks of seven other people and supporting the number of houses that we do in our community 
but that's where I've found that I thrive is in serving the community and coming back to that, that aspect. So I'm okay with being that support person. I'm okay with figuring out why the alarm is still screaming at you 30 seconds later when you definitely (laughs) entered the right code. That's what I'm here for. Our role can evolve and I can still be just as valuable and just as important in this business, um, if not more so, because I've found a team that's really good at the things I was good at eight years ago. And now I get to find new things to be really good at. And that is a transition that is, it can be hard to start questioning ourselves of, well, what value am I bringing to this? I'm not doing the walks. I'm not doing the visits. I'm not doing these things, the day-to-day operations in the field. Uh, It can be kind of an identity crisis for, for a lot of us where we think, well, man, I was the dog walker. I was the pet sitter for so many years. And I've got this person helping me and I'm not doing it as much. Ah, do I really... I, did you ever struggle with you know feeling like you deserved or didn't deserve making money off of that aspect when when you weren't the one in the field doing the visits? I have had imposter syndrome since the moment I started this job, whether I was physically doing the walks or I'm sitting on the back end answering the emails. So there's always that little bit of doubt. And the initial stages of hiring were quite the learning curve of making sure that I got the right people in. But once I did, any of that guilt of, do I deserve to be benefiting off of this? Do I deserve this or that went away? Because Mm -hmm. I could look at the team that I've curated and say, I made that. I've made this into what it is. I deserve anything that comes forward from that. Yeah, I I think that that's a very, very healthy way to view it going, um, just being honest and going, if if I didn't have this vision, if I didn't take these risks, if I didn't do these things, none of this would be here. And now it's very humbling, as you've said already, to go, how many people are getting, am I paying a month? How many families am I supporting a month? How many people am I impacting in my community every month? Uh, but again, that's something we we get to do. We want to do that. And um, and the organizing on the back end, the, the problem solving, the acquisition of clients, doing all of the management, SOPs, all that stuff, that at our at our level has such a value to the overall company that without you doing those things, the company would no longer persist, it would no longer to keep moving forward. And there is value to be had from that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely been a rewarding experience. It's been a crazy experience. And I've learned a lot along the way and made plenty of mistakes, but that makes it all the better. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've mentioned community several times already, and, and you're really, you really are integrated into your community in Peyton there. Uh, and I know you do an awful lot of uh, events and community outreach. You know, what, why do you find uh, a need or, or want to do those? Well, like I said, everything comes back to community. Our clients are part of our community. Our staff is part of our community. The animals that we're serving make up our community. And we out here are pretty rural still. We're east of Colorado Springs and and growing, but there's still this tight-knit feel out here. So to work your way into that, you need to earn it. And that has been one of the biggest things I've learned out in this area is you need to get to know your neighbors. You need to get to know, you know, the the shop owner down the street. It still has that small town feel in a lot of ways. And one of the ways that we do that is being part of like our harvest festivals in the fall and having a booth set up there so that people can know we exist or networking with rescues is one of my passions. Uh, My husband and I volunteer at a couple different rescues. And I, if I actually gave myself a paycheck every month, most of it would go to rescues in the area. (laughs) I don't, (laughs) the struggles of a business owner. I know most of the money goes there, but there's no actual paycheck. Sure. (laughs) Um, But We like being part of those little things where we're getting out there and saying we exist, but we're also doing good. Um, Mm. We have a lot of initiatives throughout our business to give back to environmental causes or to rescues in the area. 
we have been part of like the local dog jog where they go run a 5k and then they do a little festival at the end. We took our dog to a rough and mudder where they got to do like the, the tough mud 5k. He got all down and dirty with us. And then we set up a booth and found a few clients along the way from that. Mm. But word of mouth means a lot in a small town. So Mm. we've just tried to fully embrace it and being part of the community, like I said, is our goal. So what better way than to go show our faces and show that we support the other people that are out here too. That, that general support is really important uh, in those, in that kind of area. I know you mentioned your, your pretty rule. What kind of population are you, are you able, are you serving out there? You know, I need to look up the numbers because it changes every year pretty rapidly. And we've only been out here for about two years, but I think we're still technically considered an exurb. So not yet a suburb, but not really rural anymore. We've got more than just one grocery store down the street, but the really big guys haven't made their way in yet. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and and I think part of that too is just what I hear from from what I'm hearing from you, Alicia, is just a lot of community pride. Right, you like seeing these things. You like supporting. You're you, you're proud of the support that you're able to bring there with your business and serving your clients. And so having a physical presence, having being, being a face in the community is exceptionally important as business owners to be there, to show up. I know I used to struggle on, Oh, do I go to this event? Do we not go to this event? How many people are we going to get from this? We've, Oh, we went to that other one and we didn't, we didn't sign anybody up from that. So I don't know if I want to keep going to these events, but really just being a face there at the little dog, you know, bark in the park event or at the downtown dog run or at this stuff. That's really important that people see you. They recognize that's where a lot of this recognition comes from and knowing that you are a member of that community there to support others. Yeah, really. I mean, even if the person that's at the dog jog isn't your client down the line, their neighbor might be because that person remembers that you were there and that you were out supporting the rest of the area by just showing up. I've also found it's really important to do these events, even though we we don't do a, a whole lot of them. We do, we strategically put them throughout the year, but We've found that as we've had staff, it's been exceptionally important because some of our clients have only met me personally once, and then it's staff coming and going from their homes. So to be able to circle back around and see me uh, in the wild is really (laughs) reassuring to them. I'm like, I do still exist. Mm -hmm. You're you're still here. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and as you have staff, you're better able to go to these events and invest in them in that way and continue to you know, ele- elevate your presence and recognition in your community. Exactly. I was reading on your, your, your website, Alicia, and there was a moment where you t- started talking about these, these breakthrough moments that you have when caring for pets and the, you know, how much you look forward to those and, and how powerful they are. Could you did you talk about those and how you you either you know go about making them happen or 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 look forward to them? Yeah. So one way that we may stand apart from some other sitters is I've learned over the years that I do not need to be best friends with every single pet that I encounter. And that was a really big hurdle for me because of course going in and working with dogs and cats primarily. You're like, oh, I just want to pet you. I just want to be your best friend. Mm -hmm. We have a few clients where that's not the case and that's never going to be the case. So for us, the breakthrough moments come in those homes. We have one gorgeous husky and his sister is a Sheba and they've both chosen to break the molds about breed stereotypes and the Sheba, she is the friendliest, happiest, bounciest dog in the world. Husky wants nothing to do with us. Mm. We've been taking care of them for about three months now and had been trying to figure out ways to make him more comfortable with our presence in the home. We know that we can do the essentials of the job. We can set down food and water, take care of his sister. She gets plenty of love, but he just stands in the corner of the yard and doesn't, he looks at us like we are intruders, but he's not going to do anything about it, but he's going to stare at you. And our breakthrough moment actually came by me putting in a different staff member and me knowing that I may not be the greatest strength in this situation, cycled someone else into a visit, 
And while it's not like the 100% turnaround in personality, we got a hand sniff out of him the other day. And that was a huge moment for him. That was him really breaking some barriers and tearing down some of his stranger danger walls. Mm. And now I know that he loves her more than me and I'm not going to be offended. I'm just a little offended. (laughs) (laughs) It's, you know, you mentioned that, that example, um, it, that, literally happened to me over this past weekend. I was training a new staff member and we had been taking care of this family for a while. And yeah, one dog was just the friendliest thing in the world. And the other dog just, I mean, I wanted nothing to do with me and that's okay. Like I I understand that's, that's going to happen. And I was able to take, like you said, able to take care of the basics, get them taken care of, keep the dog in a low stress level and, and, and go and move on. And just, I was going to be patient with this. But man, mm-hmm. I brought this person in who was shadowing me on this visit, and that dog made a beeline straight to them and was like, "You, you are my best friend." <laughs> I was yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> like okay, again, okay. <laughs> I'm only a little offended, but I'm also really, really proud in that moment. One for choosing the team members that can make those breakthrough mm-hmm. moments, even yeah. if they're not even realizing that they're making them, but also by sticking it out and being patient and helping facilitate that growth was a really big moment. We've had a couple of those in the last few months where pets just gravitate to, and it's different each time of which staff member they like best, but I don't like every human I interact with. I don't expect animals to like every human or other animal they interact with and they choose their favorites. And if we can have a favorite for them, then we've made a big win. Well, and I think what what's important there that you point out is is being proud of having that patience because that is incredibly difficult, but it's also incredibly essential in these moments of the, you you only get to those to those breakthrough moments, you only get to those impactful times if you have patience and perseverance to to stick with it, to try new things and to experiment to 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 do what you can right to try and exhaust i'm going to say this you know kind of exhaust all of your possibilities but at the same time going i can i can only do what i can do and that's going to that's going to have to be enough for me yeah it's it's a struggle i'm not a patient person in my personal life but i've been able to find it when i work with animals so they've definitely helped me grow if nothing else <laughs> they have a way of teaching us all sorts of things don't they All of the things we don't know about ourselves that we should, all of our faults and how to improve upon them. There's always something. (laughs) Our friends at Pet Perennials makes it easy to send a heartfelt condolence gift directly to someone with a broken heart. They have this awesome direct-to-consumer gift model that takes the effort off of us and ensures a thoughtful, personalized sympathy gift reaches our client or employee on our behalf. All packages include a handwritten card, colorful gift wrap, and shipping fees across both the U.S. and Canada. They also offer an array of milestone gifts and greeting cards that can be sent to celebrate birthdays, extend get well wishes, and welcome new and rescued pets. Additionally, there are gift choices in case you need to send a sympathy gift in memory of a special human client or celebrate a pregnancy, engagement, or wedding of a pet lover. If you're interested, register for a free business gift perks account. Unlock the all-inclusive discounted package prices. Since the service is used on an as-need basis, there are no monthly or annual obligations or minimum purchase. Learn more at PetPerennials.com, check out their business programs, or register for a free gift perks account by using the link in the show notes. One of the the things that um, I I saw you recently post about, Alicia, you you wrote that you let Sky lead the way and you let them choose the pace, and it reminded us the joys of being outside and spending our days with the pets that we love. And I think that really fits with what we're talking about here, that we, we can let the pets teach us certain things and really find find appreciation and enjoy in, in each of our each of our days, especially on the not so not so good ones. So how how do you continue to find that appreciation and joy? I mean it's like you said, I let the pets lead the way. I have found myself too many times trying to just back to back to back. I've got a half hour visit, then I've got an hour visit, then I've got a half hour and I just need to go, go, go. And then I'll come into a house where the dog is still asleep when I've entered the door and they are not ready for what I am bringing to the table. (laughs) And it totally resets me. I'm like, I need to chill. (laughs) I need to reset a little bit, breathe and just go at this pet's pace. And it's made a world of difference 
honestly, in my personal life too, because I am not a chill person. I'm not a patient person (laughs) and animals keep reminding me that I need to do that more. Um, But in the last few years, I've had, I think what a lot of us face after just so many years of a lot of burnout and compassion fatigue of, can I take more on? Can I keep doing this? Am I going to keep doing this? And it's those moments where I just let an animal lead a visit of, we're going to do what you want to do today, whatever that may be, let's do it. And then I find that I really still love what I do. (laughs) That's Oh, it's it's really about letting that animal animal bring you in the moment, right? And and I think whatever way we need to do this of this is my only time with my with the pet this morning, or um, the owner's not here, I get to spend this time with them. I need to make the most of it, or I don't want to miss any details, so I have to be present. Whatever, how, whatever mindset that we need to force ourselves into, we have to force ourselves into that and and allow it to happen because otherwise we do skip over things and we do take things for granted and we will miss things. And then we ourselves will be stressed out and run ragged at the end of the day, instead of being able to embrace the thing that all of us love, right? The the pets themselves. Yeah. I mean, we all know that this is a really challenging job some days, but it can be and should be super rewarding. It's being able to spend time outside and being able to communicate and empathize with animals and make their days better and make other people's days better by giving them peace of mind. So we do so much good. It's really important to recognize that on our end as the owners and as the sitters, just how much we're doing. Yeah, I was uh, training that same person I mentioned earlier, and we had gotten through all of the technical aspects of the visits, of the feeding, of the changing the water, of giving the medication, going out to poop and pee, all this stuff. And the they they looked at me and they act and this I was kind of watching them, seeing how they were going to structure the visit after giving them some promptings, and they just looked at me and they said, "Well, now what? Uh, we've we've done everything." And I said, "Enjoy them, right? Enjoy the time." that you get with them and the look of realization on this person's face of like, Oh, right. Yeah. That, I get to go. I need to go sit on the floor and get covered in puppy kisses. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be right back. Right? It was, it was great to Isn't see that. that why realization. we started this. That's why most of us started. This is the puppy kisses and the crazy catnip cats and all of that. So it's nice to be able to return to that from time mm. to time. And yeah, I found myself the other day where I just, pushed through a visit, had finished all of those essentials, like you said. And I looked at my timer and still had 15 minutes left. (laughs) And at first I was like, did I do something wrong? Instead of just being like, now I get to enjoy this. This is so much fun. Now we get to just play. I was like, what did I miss? And then I stopped, looked at the dog who was tennis ball in boxer mouth, ready to go. (laughs) Like, no, that's what I'm here for. Thank yeah. you for reminding me. That's yeah. why I'm here. <laughs> to spend 15 minutes not getting the, ma- the ball out of the mouth once. No, sure. it well, stayed in the mouth. At least, you, at least you tried, right? That's what counts. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, you know you've you've been in business for eight years. Um, I, I I do think I remember seeing a a social media post about you starting a new initiative um, with your with your company having to do with a, a coffee shop. And so I I, I want to hear more about these these details of, about this and kind of why this was important for you to start. Yeah. So clearly, we're not all busy enough or crazy enough. So it yeah. it was time to start a second business. Um, back when I worked for the most magical place on earth, I was in the coffee industry. I helped open up some of the coffee shops that you'll find down there and loved it. I have a strong passion for animals and I have a strong love of a good cup of coffee. Now where we are talking about it still being fairly rural, the only things out here are those couple of big chains that we all know and I will not name. So it's it's just one of those things of talking about the community, my love for that, my love for animals, my love for coffee. It was time to bring everything all into one place. This is kind of a dream I had had far off and away. Like my original thought of I want to be a business owner. I'm going to I'm going to run my own cute little cafe someday. And now it's happening just with a few cat puns along the way. <laughs> And an aspect of this too is the is the community partnerships that you're bringing in with the cafe as well, right? Yeah. So 
first of all, talking about puns, I got to circle back around to that to make sure that everyone knows and understands what I'm talking about. We are going to be called affogato. So if anyone is a coffee lover already, they know that an affogato spelled with one T is a coffee beverage of espresso poured over um, ice cream or gelato. But gato with two T's is the Italian word for cat. So when you put them together, my life is complete and the world is a better place. So our goal is to work with cat rescues in our local community as an education hub of listing adoptable cats, having more information about how to volunteer and work with those rescues. Trap neuter release programs are big out here. We've got a lot of barn cats and feral cats out here that need to be looked after. And our mission will also include donating a percentage of everything we make back to those rescues to help serve them in any way that we can. Ah, okay. So will you be hosting cats at the actual cafe or is it partnering with external community members to to redirect people there? So it's going to start as primarily that education hub meet gathering place. We've learned as we've delved into this that having cats In the same place as food is very logistically challenging and insanely expensive um, with amounts of money that I do not have and will not have until I find an independently wealthy investor. So in the meantime, we're listening. (laughs) Yes, please. If you'd like to invest in a local small business, we're here and we'll take your money with great appreciation. But (laughs) in the meantime... We really think that education is one of my strong suits. I love teaching people about the great work that rescues do, uh, serving up quality coffee that can be hard to find in this area, pastries and food that are actually made here locally instead of brought in frozen, uh, becoming that gathering place for the community, and hopefully along the way hosting adoption events like out in our parking lot or working with our building neighbors to use up some of their space. We have a vet as our neighbor, so we're very fortunate there. Like It was the perfect place for us to be. We had a very serendipitous moment when we learned that there was a vet opening up right next door. Um, Mm. But yeah, just really bringing everyone together through, I think, what most people love, animals and caffeine. (laughs) It's the only thing that powers my day, those two things. (laughs) In fact, this caffeine fugue from morning to night. No, that... You, you you joked earlier about you know you weren't busy enough and that there's a lot going on. How how are you structuring your days um, to fit this in and and prioritize this without sacrificing the attention that you have or need to have on your other business? Well, I don't think this would be possible if not for my staff. So I'm going to keep giving them as many shout outs as I possibly can because. If it was still just the way we were doing things five years ago of my husband and I bootstrapping, like trying to just rough through every single day of being out on the front lines with our pet care business, this never would have been able to come to fruition. So the fact that we've made pet placations slightly more self-sustaining, obviously still us taking that support role, but being able to step back and just kind of watch things has opened up at least a little bit of that time for us to work through building codes and health department codes and all of the fun red tape involved in a brick and mortar location. Hmm. It's still a really hard juggling act. Um, There are not enough hours in the day. There never will be because that's just the type of person that I am. But caffeine gets me pretty far, like I said. So it's all about doing things in small doses, Uh, taking an hour here to do schedules for my staff and then taking an hour there to go meet with the architect and just kind of back and forth, making sure that we spread the love and attention equally. I love all of my children, businesses equally. So they all get attention. Um, but it's hard not to be spread too thin. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, having those dedicated times, I I think that sounds like that's the most important thing of going, okay, for the next 30 minutes, this is what I'm focusing on. And then for the next 30 minutes, this is what I'm focusing on to give you some structure and some idea of where you're headed, as opposed to just kind of waking up and winging it. If I were to just wing it, I would sit in an anxiety spiral all day of once I sit down, I'm never getting back up. So I just stay up. Google Google Calendar tells me where to go, whether it's to a dog walk. 
to a health department meeting or to a new client meet and greet. And I try to work all of those things into a physical schedule. So I know where I'm going, when I'm going there. And hopefully nothing gets missed along the way, though. I'm not perfect. Something will get missed along the way. <laughs> oh, don't worry. People will let you know if you've missed something. They're very good. <laughs> Absolutely. It'll be all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, did, did you feel... Uh, I guess, you know, how did you know it was the right time to start this business? Because, you know, did you feel like your other place and you mentioned you was was pretty self-sustaining as far as your placations? um, Or did you feel like you needed to strike now while there was opening in the community? Or what really was that? Okay, no, the 2023 is when this is going to happen. I don't think I could have ever possibly known when the right time was. Mm. Um, It just became one of those things that anytime I drove by a commercial space for lease, I was like, oh, that would be perfect. That location is so great. It's only 10 minutes from home. It's right in our service radius. So all of our current clients will know about us. And just as you have those little moments in the back of your head, they creep further and further forward until you're like, oh, it's, it's time. So it kind of told me, um, I don't know that I'll ever be able to give up enough control of pet placations to fully feel like it's self-sustaining and I don't need to be a part of things and can just be like that back end owner. So it wasn't going to be that telling me it was time because we've found that we uh, choose growth over reaching capacity and me taking a day off. So Mm. it was just kind of serendipity and like one of the universe telling you moments of now's now is right. And even if it's not right, now is right. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's a that's a huge thing, right? That takes a lot of of courage. It, it really does to now step out into a second business. When you when you think about eight years ago, being as you had mentioned earlier, being lost at 20, not sure in which direction now. And now this is a very confident, bold step forward. I mean you think I mean I know you mentioned you know never imagined twenty years or eight eight years ago what was going to happen um but like I mean did you see yourself as being a serial business owner an entrepreneur at this point? What twenty nine year old does really <laughs> like I don't ones that have way more money just sitting behind them ready to go <laughs> is the thing so you say bold I say crazy we mean the same thing yeah. but. I, I am just one of those people that once I have an idea, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. So like I said, mm-hmm. as it started to creep into my mind, the when has come now, I guess. There comes a point where we can't not do it anymore. And, and I think ignore that, that those thoughts. Right. <laughs> yeah. Those thoughts of, of, man, this, I just need to try this. And I think that's where many of us stumble of, of we don't even try for that next thing. We don't even seek out more information and it can be scary. and can be silly. It's like, oh, do I, I got to go talk to a realtor. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's like, there was a time where we thought we were going to open up a, a physical location for boarding and daycare. And I was going and talking to, yeah, big office buildings and, and buildings for sale and stuff. And it's like, I just have to, I have to see where this is going to go. I have to talk to people in order order to really feel out where this is going to go just to do I'm not committing to anything but I need uh-huh. to see and we find ourselves then going okay well that hurdle was I got over that and then oh well I got over that and well I guess this is just the path that we're going now yeah I mean we didn't even realize that we were really serious about this until we had signed the lease we had looked at a couple of places <laughs> and it was Exactly like you said, of going and talking to realtors for the first time and Hmm. meeting with the health department about a building that was not going to work in any situation, never would have worked. But those steps of making it feel real are exactly what makes it real. And I definitely relate to the whole, you just sit there and are afraid to go gather information or take that next step. But if you don't, you might be missing out on the greatest success you'll ever have. And even if it's not the greatest success you'll ever have, one of the best learning experiences. 
I, I love that a lot, Alicia. I really want to thank you for coming on the show today and sharing about your journey, encouraging us to seek out those opportunities and to dig deep in our communities to make a big impact uh, for people who are interested in learning more and following along with all of the cool stuff that you're doing and watch the build out and see how you're going to decorate it and all that stuff and be and maybe even attend the grand opening if they're in the area. Uh, how, how best can people get in touch with you and follow along with all of your work? Yeah, so right now we are in the building phase of the back end of things as well, but we do have a Facebook page for Affogato up and running. You can follow us on any social media as Affogato, which is A-F-F-O-G-A-T-T-O. Um, you can always email us at info at affogato.coffee if you have any questions or trying to start your own place too and want to learn from some of our mistakes. And then for our pet care side of things, we are pet placations on all social media and our email is contact at alishaspetplacations.com. Awesome. And I will have links to all of those in the show notes and on the website so people can get connected with you and follow along with all the cool stuff. Um, Alicia, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to, to share that with us. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm an avid listener to you guys. So this was a lot of fun. How do you see yourself fitting into your community? What connections are you making? How are you growing a network of not just other pet care providers, but other pet enthusiasts and business owners where you live? As we approach people, as we take the best thing that we can in the world, the pets, the animals that we care for, and we share that in that community, people can't help themselves but want to be a part of it. Lean into those connections, develop and dig deep into those relationships that you make so that you can make your community a more pet friendly and more pet accepting place for your clients. We want to thank today's sponsors, Time to Pet and Pet Perennials for making today's show possible. And we really want to thank you so much for listening. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and we'll be back again soon. I'm <laughs> sorry.